What's good, people? v Podcast, episode 67, I believe. Me, Roy, from the Gym's Rec. I'm Ms. Henley, all back again. News, views, and uh, everything in between. So, lads, let's kick off with a topic that uh, has divided us a little bit this week. You know what I'm talking about, Jim Reese. So, Mason Greenwood. Mason Greenwood, I am going to call, and it's a big, Reese, calm down now, right? He is a generational talent. Now, the reason I say this is because nobody is doing what he's doing. When you look at... Well, scoring um, goals against bottom half teams. Let's say now, calm down. Right, so Mason Greenwood, initially, if you're going to build a striker, he's got the physique, he's got both feet, which he can... I still don't know what foot he is. He's electric. He, his movement is incredible for someone so young, and he can play in a variety of different positions across the front three. His goal scoring record at youth level, now, which I know for a lot of people doesn't count for much, is pretty unmatched. I mean, he was doing things at youth level that players like Foden and Sancho, none of them have done. He's come into that Manchester United team, a team which, by the way, needed a catalyst, right? They had Bruno Fernandes, who's been the biggest catalyst. But I would go as far as to say Greenwood coming in on that sort of right hand side has been the second biggest catalyst. Now, for him to get, I think it's 16 goals in a debut season with very limited experience, and you can only beat what's in front of you. I look at him, and a lot of people are the same. They see, obviously, shades of Robin Van Persie and a few other people. I think he is going to be the biggest talent of his generation, with Phil Foden and Sancho a close second. Debate me. Where do you start? Uh, We had, where do you... I think one year ago, I had a conversation that in which you've said almost the exact same things about Hudson O'Doy. These things... That's facts, I did say that. These things happen every year. There's a, there's a, there's a breakthrough player. Yeah, fair enough. His numbers are good. Um, most of his goals have come in cup and you know, Europe, European competitions. He's scored a few goals <laughs> since the restart and he has come back you know, energised and things. Whether that's because of his youth that he's had that edge on defenders is one thing. Whether it's because he's playing against second-rate left-backs like Neil Taylor, uh, etc., is, is another. Um, with Mason Greenwood, you said if you're building a striker, you'd build him exactly the way he is. He doesn't even play as a striker. And oh, he, uh, again, going back now, he was a striker in the youth teams. And right. he is going to I'm be a striker long-term. Right in the youth, in the youth no, team. No, no, no. He, he, he plays right wing, and he's going to need to be able to adapt to that, especially if they want to... You know, have him in the team with Martial as a central striker. Look, with, with Mason Greenwood, um, my concern is that he won't do it against the big teams. Um, I find I found that Southampton pressed Manchester United in the most recent game, and Mason Greenwood was rendered ineffective, um, where Rashford and Martial were able to be effective. So. But why that? Why he was so ineffective in that game, and Rashford and Martial were good. I don't know. But would that? Would you say that's somebody who looks like he's going to be the talent of his generation? I mean, no. A couple of points there, um, Rhys. Um, I think Mason Greenwood was highlighted to um, Hassan Hudel as probably the most lethal threat in that game, and I noticed that he was doubled up on a lot of the time, which when you do get doubled up on, frees up space for other people in that forward line. What I also say was, um, he is playing on the right um, side of a three at the moment, but if you listen to a lot of people like Guy Neville saying, is that the, he's had to come in as, come in on the right side rather, because the striker position is already occupied by Martial. Right. But like Neville keeps saying that, if this guy keeps scoring like he is and playing as well as he is on the right, then there's going to be nothing stopping him taking the main striker position. That if he keeps going the way he is, it, he's going to make it his own position. Um, as for the generational talent, I don't want people to like. Some people would hear say that and, and, and make up like we're trying to say he's going to be the best player to ever lived. That's not what we're saying by generational talent. What we're saying is that this kid, uh, Mason Greenwood, has been talked about. In the in sort of the United ranks and other people around his age for many many a year, about even people before him like Rashford, even like quality players come out of the United um, Academy before, they haven't seen anybody 
who can use both feet like he can and get anywhere near the numbers that he that he has got. And yes, you have to translate that into Premier League first team football, which is a different animal. But people wouldn't share about Marcus Rashford when he was in um, the youth and the reserves and what numbers he was getting. And he's obviously come through and established himself and he is yeah, a good player. But and, and people people talk about Rashford the same way that they're talking about Mason Greenwood. People but if I, people were uh, we're banging on about Mason Greenwood to a whole new level than what they were about Rashford. That they're almost as if he is twice the player. That's what people saw when they were coming through. If Rashford is this good, then how good is Greenwood going to be? And that's where the hype was coming from. So, yeah, I can understand. Say, I, 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 look, I, I'm a football fan. I can understand the hype. I, I, I enjoy it when a player comes through the youth team and, and does well. Um, Everyone enjoys it when a player comes to the youth team and does as well as Mason Greenwood is doing, but he hasn't done enough in the game to re- to warrant to warrant uh, talk like talk like, like you know generational talent, for example. Now, I would worry that he would turn out like Rashford. When you Rashford, say, well, what's what's the worry with Rashford? Because what the what the worry is is worry that because... Rashford's a decent. The worry is is that Rashford's a decent player. Now, it's not a worry if you sold Rashford, then you'd get. A substantial amount of money. Rashford's never going to win you a Premier League title. That's where you want to be. I beg to differ on that. I think Rashford in the front. Bear in mind, Rashford, Martial, okay. and Greenwood all have twenty goals each this season. Or Greenwood's close to getting twenty goals. Sorry, no other. I think United team have had three strikers like that since the sixties. So, what do you expect of Marcus Rashford then? Because that's phenomenal. That's phenomenal numbers. Bear in mind, Firmino hasn't scored a Premier League goal. You Anfield in a long time. cannot compare Rashford, Martial and Greenwood to George Best, Bobby Child and the Dennis Law. I don't think it was that side from what I gather, but it was a different one. Or, or Tevez, Ronaldo, Rooney. You can't, can't compare No, no, of course them. you can't. But it's, ultimately what so they're doing so at their difference. age. Now, look, Rashford will never be in that top bracket. He's not good enough. Um, he's not good enough to play as a winger. And, in that capacity, nor is he a good enough centre forward. You couldn't put him in the same bracket as where Sterling's been playing or Mane. You couldn't put him in the same bracket as a Ronaldo or when he was at Chelsea, I guess most people would have said Hazard. I, um, I would argue that Rashford is getting better every year and he's I would, I would make that same case. He was younger same than case. he is a lot younger than Mane and Sterling. So whilst he might not quite be at something like Mane's level yet, I'm not saying that he is, his numbers are on par. And his, his, his ability can take him there. But with, again, you say Greenwood doesn't want the um, generational talent. What I'll, say, what I'll say is he has huge potential and he's taken, a, he's taken his chance massively. Yeah, and, and all people are saying is that they dubbed him to, be, to do exactly what he's doing right now. Is that what everyone said about him? He is like beginning to do it. He hasn't reached it yet. But so... You can't say that people... I think the major problem with Manchester United fans is that people get overexcited about the smallest of things. I think it's I think. for all fans. They do it. If, if, if then you look at, people you look don't share about Phil you look at one of those players in your team, uh, I'll, I'll, just need, I'll go through a few. Um, you've got McTominay, Brandon Williams, uh, obviously Mason Greenwood, Rashford. These players that people have really, really hyped when they've broken through into the first team with a few good performances. But they're not the players that are going to get you the league title. Possibly Mason Greenwood, just because we don't know how good he's going to turn out to be. We know he's had four or five games in the Premier League against average, average opposition, um, yeah, I, all, of which, all of which possibly fatigued from the restart. I don't think it's fair to say it's a Manchester United thing, though. We, the same happens with Chelsea players. Hudson Adoy, Loftus Cheek, Billy Gilmore. Same happens with Foden. Same I'll, give with you I'll, give, I'll give you Gilmore, but um, I think I think with Manchester United especially, I think there's a there's definitely um, an overhype culture, and I don't mean that as if to have a vendetta against Man United fans. I think it happens with Manchester United. I think it's just a phenomenon. I think it happens with any young English player, especially. Um, the fact that Mason Greenwood plays for Manchester United and is English um, doesn't help, really. I think the pr- I think the pressure is going to be you know, heaped on him, and, and will he handle that pressure? You know, probably, maybe. But to say he's to say he's the standalone player of his generation based on four or five games 
Premier League games against mid-table and relegation, you know, fodder opposition is a huge, huge jump. A huge jump. If because that that's similar to being to playing in in you know in the championship against the teams going for promotion. So with that you've, being got, you've, got, that, you've got Ryan, you've got Ryan Brewster in the championship playing for Swansea, and he's up against teams which aren't too far off, and he's getting goals, and he's of a similar age. No one's calling him a generational talent. They're they're very different prospects. I think you've undersold Greenwood a little bit. You definitely undersold Rashford. I, th- I think it's best to undersell these players. Let them prove themselves to be that good before you say that they're going to be that good. Uh, you know, I can spot. You know, at the end of the day, there's two types of people. There's a Picasso and there's someone who can paint by numbers. And Greenwood's a Picasso. So I'm willing to die on that hill. Moving forward, obviously you talk about fatigue. Well, you know. Maybe Greenwood was fatigued the other night as well. Obviously, he's played a lot of games in, in quick succession. He's played a lot of minutes. You know, he's only a young lad. He's carrying that team on his back a little bit. So I, I'm willing to die on that hill, Reese. I'm willing to say he's a generational talent. Well, one of us we'll is going to be right. I, and, and either he's going to be the best player in his generation in the world, or he isn't. And the odds would be in my favour on that one, I think. I'll take that bet. I'm willing <laughs> to take that bet, Becky. What about you, bro? Um, I, I definitely am more on your side than I am Reese's, and you know that. Yeah. Um, and, and wait, just just for the record, I'm not saying he's not going to be a very good player. What I'm saying is, is that he hasn't shown over a long, long, a long enough yeah. period of time that that is definitely going to be the case. I got you. And talk about it like it's facts, because it isn't. Not not facts. No, it, it, but everything's an opinion, isn't it? Like when people are saying he's going to be the child of his generation. That is just an opinion based on what people know and have seen. So, like, yeah, we're, we're not saying that. If it's not fact, it's, we can never say that, can we? But um, I believe that from what I've heard and seen, that he could very well be just that. Yeah, that's true. I think one thing, which is interesting the point, that you see those things that come up, you know, periodically on BBC Sport and things. Here's what our top football journalist predicted to be the England team in four years time and it's got you know Ben Anik in goal or, or you know all, all these all these weird footballers who fade into obscurity um, it can happen to anyone it really can and there's no point getting too too carried away with these things it's best to just enjoy a young player playing with freedom That's we'll, what I'll do. we'll do that for now speaking of another young player playing with freedom, which Reese is an excellent fucking segue into what I was going to say next. Another, what some may say, and again, I haven't seen enough of him, a generational talent, is Kai Havertz. Now, with Kai Havertz, the link to Chelsea is very strong. It seems like, according to a lot of people in Germany, he really wants to leave Germany and come to the Premier League. Now, I initially thought Liverpool might be a good move for him, but then I was like, mm, I don't really know where he'd maybe fit in. Um, Arsenal aren't going to be able to afford him. He would never go to Spurs, I don't think, and the Mourinho. Um, United, again, don't really need him. City, mm, he could maybe fit him in, but it's unlikely. So it looks like Chelsea's the logical spot. So what do you think about him, lads, and his ability? Do you think he'd fit in well with the Chelsea? And if you do think he'd fit in, where would he fit in? Well, I think well, that's, that's my first question. Where would he fit in? Well, Chelsea. I think, James, before we, before we start, I think me and you watched a lot of Bundesliga football. Um, over the start of the reset. And that's something we, we, we both said straight away was this Havertz guy is he is he is Looks so very good. good. He's very good. And he started as um started as a ten, didn't he? Mm. Um yeah. but he's been playing centre forward for for Leverkusen and he's been leading the line really well. Yeah. And he's mm-hmm. been getting goals. Um he doesn't look like a traditional centre forward. The the problem is with uh, Liverpool, like you said, is you know, they've got a Firmino. They don't really play with a 10. So it wouldn't really work for Liverpool, I don't think. Yeah. And with Chelsea, they've just bought Werner and Zayesh. And Zayesh, for me, doesn't quite have the the pace required to be out wide, which means that those two players are going to be central. So do I think he'd fit into Chelsea? No. But he does strike me as a player that would fit into Real Madrid. Hmm. OK, what do you reckon, Becky? Yeah, I, I, again, I don't see where he, where he slots into that Chelsea line. You look at the, the the talent they've got there now with Werner, Pulisic, um, Zayac, and then you know you could people like Hudson Odoi, Giroud, William. Um, 
I, I don't personally see where he would fit in. Chelsea do um, have been known in the past for overkill, um, signing players just so nobody else can sign them. Um, they did it with William when he was about to go to Spurs. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it wouldn't put it past me to sign him. I'm pretty sure either Leverkusen or, or his agent have come out in the past couple of days um, saying that Havertz um, doesn't actually mind signing for a club that's not going to be playing Champions League football next season. Interesting. Like it's his aim, but you know it's not going to be the the, the seal the deal. Um, to which Hartlepool United actually retweeted it saying club announcement pending, um, <laughs> which I found quite funny. But um, yeah, I, I don't think he'll end up in the Premier League. Um, really? Yeah, I no, don't need. Like, I I think it's one of those in there. Like there's so much money in the Premier League, it almost makes sense to link them to these clubs just to end up with better deals or, yeah, yeah. or just so uh, yeah. a European club can come in and steal them. You are finding, I've, there, there, is, there is a lot, especially since lockdown, but more t- over, over the last few weeks as, uh, as the announcement of the summer transfer window has been pending. There's been a lot of lazy journalism. There's been a lot of non-news stories. Yeah. Stories that appear to be fake. I think we discussed a Jaden Sancho one. Um, we've discussed a Thiago to Liverpool story. I think all of these news stories have appeared unlikely and haven't really been followed up or caught any traction, really. Yeah. Um, so I think I don't think there's a lot of a lot of action on the transfer front at the moment, um, other than what's been announced. Uh, you know, the, the Chelsea signings and so on. Mm. But especially, I agree with you, Beck. I think that Havertz will will go abroad if anywhere. He's got a good thing at Leverkusen, um, but I, I do think he wants to play Champions League football despite what his agent says. Um, mm-hmm. I do think he will end up going to Real Madrid if, if he goes anywhere. It's an interesting move, the Chelsea one, because I sat down the other night and I thought to myself, OK, so where does he fit in? Because like you said, Reese, he started as a 10, he can play as a 9, but he can also come in from kind of either wing almost. He's very, um, he's deceptively quick and his movement is terrific. Looking at that Chelsea side, if they were to line up in a 4-3-3, for example, um, so you have a front three of Pulisic, you have uh, Zayac, and you have Werner, and as a midfield three, very similar to what Manchester City do. They have, obviously, two creatives and a holding midfielder. So let's say you have Ngolo Kante as a holding midfielder, and you have Mount and... Um, uh, Kovacic or Barkley, is it? You can have Mount and Havertz either side. You could do it. I mean, you could pull it off. You know, you can you can put him in there. I mean, he offers a, a much bigger threat than a lot of other Chelsea midfielders. But like you said, Vecchi, I think they do have a bit of overkill sometimes. I mean, that Chelsea squad is pretty well stacked with midfielders. And the one thing I wanted to bring up about Chelsea as well, especially after the Sheffield United performance and the Habits links, they don't have one world-class defender. Not one. Period. So... Every well, you know, every club really needs a centre half bar Liverpool, to be honest with you. So I think Chelsea, yeah, they should really be probably be looking at um at the defence. But yeah, I think we're all in agreement, lads. Havertz is gonna be he's gonna be a hell of a player. Wherever wherever he's generational you know, talent, I think. A gen- we are we agreeing on that? <laughs> <laughs> are we wow, oh wow, this is news, right? So yeah, Havertz the generational talent. You heard it here first. Now, moving swiftly on. Another big topic that actually came out tonight. Well, it's been out a few days, but the, uh, the end product came out tonight, shall we say. It's AFTV. Now, AFTV have, I don't know if the word is sack Claude, because I don't know if he was actually employed by them, or if he was getting paid, or if he did it out of the goodness of his heart. Yes, he I think, I, apparently, it seems like he was getting some sort of money out of it. So um, they relieved him of his duties, so to speak, as a pundit or a presenter. Um, so they'll no longer be working with him on YouTube. Um, regarding Arsenal content. So just to give people some sort of context as to what happened there, um, they were doing like uh, a live stream, as they do. So it was, um, I think it was a few people. There was uh, Robbie, DT, Troops, Ty, Claude, maybe uh, I think a Lee Gunner was another one or someone. I, I can't remember the lad's name. Yeah. Anyway, Claude made a remark um, as uh, Son was being substituted. Now, the remark was DVDs going off. Now, for us, we don't live in London, so the slang is maybe in the, the context and interpretation is obviously very different. Um, but just to, um, to give you some sort of context as to what happened. So he said DVD is going off. Now, from what I read here, and this is just um, 
this is just you know a little bit of internet news because again I'm not fully up on the slang so basically it's apparently it's a London saying it's a derogatory slur aimed at the Asian community which depicts them as people who sell pirated DVDs on streets and in pubs so for a man of his generation Claude he would have obviously seen a lot of Asian people potentially I don't know selling DVDs in London so he said obviously DVDs going off I didn't initially pick up on it being a racist term, but then it's because I suppose it's not something that's ever been used where we live. Um, what's your take on it, lads? I mean, in terms of him making a, a comment like that, do you think that removing him from the platform is the best thing to do? Or would it be better to use him as a tool for educational purposes and say, look, a leopard can change his spots. What we're gonna do, we're not gonna remove him. We're going to basically educate him uh, we're going to you know, document the journey and we can show to people that, you know, you can have different views and you can change. I don't know. Uh, pers- personally, I think that any any business or, or podcast or, or or entertainment outlet in the modern day, especially with the hot button issues that are you know surrounding, especially football these days, but mm. also society, they just cannot be seen to have anything like that associated with their channel yeah. um it's not acceptable uh it's not people do, do need educating um but generally speaking for people of, of, of a certain generation um these views are hardwired um yeah. they're incorrect they're outdated um but these people shouldn't be able to continue doing what they're doing spreading hate with uh, a platform behind them. Yeah. Okay, what's your take, Becky? Um, yeah, kind of a similar thought. In with the way that the world is um, nowadays, and especially in 2020, with you know, with all the things that that are going on, I, I don't think there's a way that he can get away with it, and nor should they let him, because the 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 sort of traction that came from it afterwards was just too much. Yeah. Just the magnifying glasses. Like it's it's just so like honed in on on that kind of thing nowadays that there's no way that that they can't get rid of him. And like we said, it, um, Claude is not a young fella. I don't know his exact age. You know, he's been around many years. He, he knows what the term means, and and the fact that he thought in the moment it was okay to use it is not acceptable. Yeah. And again, like we said, it's these people are, of different generations. They have their views and opinions and they're, they're not likely to change yeah, uh, yeah. like he, he's if he has that opinion now and he uses that term now he probably uses that term a lot and he probably uses it day to day or around the people who share the same opinion as him mm. um, and obviously on, on AFTV with the audience that they've got you can't do that so um, I, I get what you mean in terms of like you want to educate people where possible and, and people do need to be educated in order for like like derogatory and racial issues to be rectified, it, it, it does come from an educational thing up. But, you know, the guy's like 50 odd. Isn't he like 40, 50 odd? So I think, I mean, bro, he might be older than that. Right? I think possibly. he might be pushing 60. I don't know his exact age. It, um, just to get, again, give you some sort of context, lads, because again, I don't know how much you know about it, but obviously the incident happened on a live stream. Um, and obviously a lot of fans picked up on it. So they initially then sat down, it was Robbie and Claude, and they did like a video. And the video was designed to try and give people context as to what's gone on. So they kind of balls that up a little bit. Well, I say a little bit, they really fucked it up, right? Because they had a chance to kind of just say, look, we were wrong, we're sorry, we're gonna move forward. We, you know, we're gonna educate people and we're gonna try and do better. But what they did was they went on AFTV, the platform. And basically Claude tried to turn around and say, Oh, I wasn't actually calling him DVD. I was talking about the Spurs end of year DVD, right? And obviously he didn't say that. It was, you know, I don't know who decided that was the thing to say, right? But it was beyond obvious that that wasn't what was said. And they just really ballsed it up a bit. Do you know, if I could compare it to something, it would be a bit like Liverpool with the Suarez shirt. You know, instead of just saying, all right, we, we got this one wrong, we're sorry. They, they just, they just, it was, oh, it was a painful watch because Claude was stuttering and he was moaning and he was kind of he didn't really get his words out properly and there was no empathy there was no sympathy there was there was no nothing it was just like yeah it was about the Spurs DVD at the end of the year 
and I was just thinking, oh, yeah, and, yeah and, and to some people, and to some people, um, these these racially charged jokes um, or uh, phrases, um, utterances, they are a bit throwaway, uh, mm. and, and some people can see them as. Um, you know, political correctness gone mad in some ways. Um, but that's not the case with this. Um, if you've got a platform and you are saying these things, then, you sh then he should have owned up to it and just, you, sh you know, he should have gone on the defensive straight away. Um, but, you know, it's not acceptable. It's, it, it, Arsenal fans have done the right thing and they can move on now without scrutiny yeah and one thing you've got to take into account as well is a lot of the viewers of arsenal fan tv would be those in perhaps asian and especially ethnic minority oh yeah huge huge numbers of fans yeah so i think yeah it rub, it, ironically it rubbed up you know it rubbed people uh, uh, sorry rubbed them up the long way but or rubbed them up the wrong way um but a lot of people um they Twitter was very divided by it. It was very, very divided, which was strange. Uh, generally, you find with sort of racial slurs or things like that, especially lads, as you said, what's going on? Everyone's kind of on the same wavelength. But um, yeah, with this one, it was very divided. It was interesting, though. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, we'll probably revisit it later down the line if there's, if there's any more talk about it. But um, yeah, Claude is gone from AFTV. He's done. So moving forward then, Becky, talk to us about the transfer window dates. We were talking about... Uh, sorry about the transfer window days before we uh, we came on. Um, explain to the people obviously when it's all going down. Yeah, so um, Sky Sports have announced today that um, they plan for the transfer window to open on the 27th of July, um, and that will stay open until October the 5th, um, which I make is that about 10 or 11 weeks, which is quite a long time, isn't it? Long. Um, for, you know, in terms of that to be open, and there, there's also in the pipeline an, an extended transfer window from the 5th of October to the 16th, which is a domestic transfer window only, um, okay. where Premier League clubs can't um, buy and sell from each other, but um, they can do business from down the EFL um, sort of pyramid and up. So um, that's what's in the pipeline. Um, so that was announced today, pretty much on Sky Sports, it's, it's, it's done and dusted. So. My only great question with that is, will our transfer sort of market line up with the other transfer market in, in the other leagues? Yeah, I was about to ask that same question because obviously that's the issue we've had previously is whether the English window or the British window was ended. And yeah. um, that's allowed other clubs to maybe have an advantage. What do you reckon, Reese? Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, you can't really read into it too much just because a transfer window is a transfer window will it give some clubs advantage over others the fact of the matter is, is that the transfer window always closes at different times for different countries anyway mm. um, what you would hope is that clubs can have the chance to recover financially um, from, from the COVID situation you'd hope that they would be able to make the signings that they need and I think that the, the the length of time that the transfer window is open from and until we'll be able to give clubs that chance. Um, I think from uh, my, my own personal view so as a supporter, um, it does give the Premier League time to box off the Newcastle takeover as they're going to need, if this goes through, they're going to need <laughs> that time. They're going to need that Here time. We go, no. well, they, either way, if it gets approved or rejected, they're going to need that amount of time to be able to prepare with or without Bruce, with or without, you know, multi-million pound signings. So, and, and for different reasons, there's clubs in, similar, in the similar, a similar boat to that. You know, you've got um, clubs who won't be relegated until, you know, the end of July. They're going to need to plan their future, whether it's in the Championship or the Premier League, and they're going to have to know where they are financially. So having that extra time on the transfer window will afford them the time to do that. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. It's going to be a pretty hectic um, couple of years in football now because everything's so condensed. Um, obviously, you've got you know this transfer window run until October, Becky, you said. Potentially, yeah. then you may have you know a, a transfer window in the new year. Plus, then you've got another transfer window and then you've got the Euros. 
I believe I may have read earlier, lads. Um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. The Qatar World Cup is going to be played in November 2022. Yeah, it's yeah. Yeah, so again, interesting how a transfer window would work before that as well. Obviously, with the season going on. Yeah, it's, it's interesting times. I mean, the transfer window is probably one of my favourite times of the year. I do enjoy the rumours. I do enjoy the uh, palaver that comes with it. Um, I, it'll be interesting this year, obviously, pandemic-wise, to see who are the biggest spenders, who can be what. I think a lot of people are going to hold their cards very close to their chest. I don't think a lot of people want to give away how much money they have, apart from Manchester United, who always seem to give away how much money they have. Um, Newcastle will be the interesting one, Luis. Uh, ultimately, that's quite a big window. And if the takeover is done early in the window, I'd be very, very interested to see who they sign. Yeah, well, with Newcastle at the moment, I mean, I, we, we mentioned before the podcast, there's lots of rumours. Richard Keyes has now got involved out of all people, and he, he thinks it will go through this Friday. Look, we don't know when it's going to go through. And whether it does or doesn't go through, they need to prepare well. Mm. That being said, I would be surprised if we didn't see an extremely exciting transfer window by Tottenham, um, especially with Mourinho heading into his second season. He is going to ask for a war chest um, and he is going to have a clear idea of what he wants. And I think he'd be wielding the axe as well on, on, on a few players. Yeah. Um, they're going to be the team to watch. Do you reckon? Yeah, OK. Oh, uh, one other thing Spurs related as well. Um, our condolences to Serge Aurier and his um, his brother that got shot and killed yeah. the night. Um, so yeah, our condolences to him and his Very family. Sad. Yeah, um, horrendously sad. He's actually starting tonight as well. Is he really? Newcastle, yeah. Which is, um, yeah, fair play to him because I'm pretty sure Mourinho and and, and those around him would have, would have obviously said there's, there's no need for you to play, you know, in these circumstances. Yeah. But... For some people, it's a coping mechanism, isn't it? And if he um, be playing football is what he loves, and yeah, he's obviously chosen to play. But very, very sad, um, for, you know, for Aurier and Tottenham. But just, just going back to the transfer window slightly, I think this, and I hope I don't overplay it now because it could turn out to be quite shit. But that, I think this year's transfer window, we could see um, lots and lots of exciting activity because it's just. We don't know, do we? Because of the pandemic, we've never had a year, a football calendar year or a football transfer window like this, right? But like we just said, now with Mourinho, he, there's a lot of um, signings that he wants to make and it's, it's his first proper window. Mm. Uh, Chelsea have kind of, their business has kind of been done a little bit and it, it, you know, it won't sort of, if, if they'd made those two signings during the window, you know, it would have been a bit more excitement. United yeah. obviously now seem on the right path, so they know that they're a couple of signings away from good signings, obviously, from challenging. Um, and then you've got City, have got some obvious holes, they want their title back. I just think a lot of the top um, Premier League clubs know that know what they need. I mean, mm-hmm. I think there's a lot of activity to come this year. Hope yeah. I'm right. Yeah, fingers crossed. A good transfer window, especially in the last sort of week of it as well. Yeah. Who doesn't love a good transfer window? Anybody that doesn't like a good transfer window, I don't fully trust them. I don't know. The best part, the best you part know, people being the... I'm going to ask Newcastle. Newcastle. <laughs> Look, Newcastle will be the, the underdogs in the transfer window because whilst financially, I think, obviously, you know, they're going to be able to throw wedges of money at people. Their pandemic, uh, a shaky pandemic, is not our pandemic, right? They're two very different things. A shake pandemic is white tigers and champagne. The rest of us are living off the fucking super noodles, right? They are going to splash the cash. Right? Those guys have got it going on. So I would be interested to see how they use that money to convince people about the Newcastle project. Well, I mean, with um, with the with the takeover, Amanda Stavey was um, who is spearheading brokering the deal. She was uh, quoted as to saying. They're not so focused on pumping money into signings as they are more the infrastructure and and the city and the projects in the city. And I think I um I think I speak for all Newcastle fans when I say that we don't really mind if we don't sign any good players as long as we get some more uni accommodation and yeah. um, <laughs> score in the city, that would be great. Yeah, Newcastle really needs another Tiger Tiger in fairness. Yeah, that's the one thing it needs. It doesn't really need a centre half, but yeah, we could use some cheap Jaeger bombs, definitely. Yeah, no, shout out to them. Um, moving forward, lads, very quickly, just to touch upon Norwich as well, they could relegate it. Um, they were good eggs, they give it their best. They got off to a flyer and eventually 
it just petered out. Um, how do you feel like you know they, they did in the end? Do you feel like they could have? Is there a particular area where you think Norwich excelled? Yeah. Well, one thing with my good go on, go on back. I was just going to say, it turns out that um, even with Pookie, there is no party, doesn't it? Yeah, because no um, they, they, they did get off to a flyer, as you said. But I think to, to give it sort of a brief sort of roundup for me, when you come up from the championship, teams like Aston Villa have shown that, and Fulham a couple of years back, have shown that throwing a lot of money at it doesn't necessarily always work. Very true. Very, but very true. More often than not, if you pump in, you don't have to pump in 150 million, but if you invest a decent amount into decent players that are a little bit level above you, that is your best chance of doing well mm. um, as a championship club. Unless you're an exception to the rule, someone like a Swansea or a Bournemouth, that they came up with uh, like a blueprint and an identity which teams couldn't work out. Yeah. Uh, and that's why. A lot of championship clubs that come up and don't spend, like Norwich, and I get their ethos, you know, they want to be financially stable and, and going down now, they can afford to lose players mm. and with their parachute payments. They're, from what I hear is that they're not a club that's going to be financially in trouble because they've done it the, the right way, you know, yeah. they haven't splashed yeah. lots of money. But if, if you're a Norwich fan, is that enough for you? Knowing that, like, yeah. are you not going to think you could have done more, a couple of signings here and there? Or are you happy that you, you went up the way that you were playing, didn't change it? You play your football's easy on the eye when it works, even if you lose five one or yeah. five three. Yeah, I, I think I think with Norwich, they they cannot be content to keep do, doing what they're doing. I I, I tell you, a stat guys, um, Norwich have recently become the only team in England to be promoted from the Championship as the league winner the runner-up and through the playoffs, as well as to get relegated in 18th, 19th and 20th uh, really? position in the league. Uh, and they've done that all in an 11-year period. Uh, so well that, that says a lot about where they are. Yeah. Now, yes, they've gone up as champions, finally, but they've come, they've come back down as the rock-bottom team. Um, they had, I think the problem with Norwich this year is that was their recruitment. They they did not invest well. They invested, they did, but they did buy players. I think they bought Rupp, they bought Steeperman, uh, both of which, by the way, have been awful, uh, mm. awful signings. I think Steeperman especially has been exceptionally below par this year. Um, and then you look at Duda, who they signed in January, to yeah. that didn't work. Um, Pookie has come up from the championship, as well as Buendia, and they just, they haven't done it. Buendia has been their best player. Uh, this year and he's got one goal um, he's only chipped in with one goal this year and seven assists which isn't good enough if you're if you're expected to be the main man and I think the main issue with them has been that they just haven't gone for games I think it's been about not losing games rather than rather than going in and giving things a real go uh, I think you probably accuse Aston Villa of the same thing really although they are they are looking like you know they, they Although unlikely, they could still they could still stay up, um, but you cannot come to the Premier League with that mentality because you will yeah. get found yeah. out. Yeah, very true. I mean, at least the positives for them, Norwich going down, like you said, Becky, they are financially stable. I mean, the benefits of having the players they have is they have some very is it I don't know what I'm looking for a saleable or sellable assets. I mean, looking through the team, right? Godfrey linked with a host of clubs. He's going to have a big future. Um, Aaron's Lewis. Uh, Buendia, obviously Cantwell as well. Even somebody might take a chance on Puki too. So yeah, they've um, they've got you know they they live to fight another day. I think that's basically yeah, the yeah. You know, I I agree with everything you said there, but I think it's an opportunity missed in a way because you name all those players who have a lot of potential. The both the fullbacks, um, Godfrey, Buendia, Cantwell. You just can't help but think that if they put a, a bit of a solid investment in other areas, you know, where could they be? And then, you know, yeah. it's not, you know, they, they could have invested more money in the wrong players and they could have ended up with, with less money and still going down. But you can't half-ass the Premier League nine times out of 10. You can't, you, you have to make a go of it. And I, you know, I said Aston Villa Fulham, it can go wrong, but 
I think if you don't invest really anything of worth, then you can expect to come back down. And, and now it's just going to be that yo-yo club, like we said, in 11 years, three promotions, three relegations. Yeah. It's, something's got to give, isn't it? You've got to approach it differently. It's not good enough. It's, it's, it really isn't good enough. And I don't think, I might be wrong in saying this, but I don't think they've actually survived a season in the Premier League. Um, I don't think they have. No, I'm yeah, sure. I don't I think they have either, actually, yeah. And that you've got to look at you've got to look at managerial recruitment as well, you know. Mm. Um, I think that Daniel Farker has a has an incredible relationship with the chairman, uh, but really his his football wasn't working. He should have gone in November or December. They should have brought in somebody, you know, somebody like Sam Allardyce. Oh, yeah. you somebody who's got a track record of of doing I know what you mean doing the ugly stuff, um, and you look to build from there um but it hasn't happened they know what they're doing they have a plan for what they're doing will the supporters appreciate that roller coaster i don't know um do the, do the neutrals buy into it i don't um and do i think it's it's sustainable long term absolutely not interesting takes interesting all right lads is there anything else you want to bring up before we wrap this up no, I think I think I've written down we've um we've glossed over, so I'm all good. Cool. All right then, gents. Thanks again for coming on. The news and the views done with well, at least until next Monday when we're back again. So yeah, that's it from us. Again, add us up on the social media platforms. Um all the uh, information will be in the uh, sort of description below. Um we're getting more and more subscribers all the time, so keep subscribing. We're on the road to a thousand subscribers. Um like this video, algorithm issues, we're all trying to get involved. So, you know, do your thing, people. Um, and let us know your opinions. We're always free to talk. So yeah, let us know how you feel about what we talk about and uh, and everything else. I've been Rory Spooner. The gang will be back with me again uh, next week. I'm gonna see you then, people. Take care. Ciao.